So uh, to that end, um, I'm going to be reviewing some uh, elements of what you should already have learned about in the video that I circulated to you for watching, not, not on Thursday, but on Tuesday, a week ago today, um, before I was struck down with illness, but where there was a conflicting commitment. And um, we're going to go through some exercises together, dealing with the fact that I'm only dealing with one screen connected here. I'm, I don't have multiple screens, so we'll have to bear with the, the limited chat accessibility. But I'm going to be going with you through some exercises involving test case design and some principles on um, effective techniques or techniques that can enhance the effectiveness of your test case design. And indeed, more substantively yet than that, to hammer home some basic principles of test case design that somehow seem to be missed by some students um, in this class when it comes to things like uh, pop quizzes or final exams. Um, and indeed, projects. So we're going to try to hit those points home while exercise while emphasizing some high level principles like the use of of, of a analysis to identify equivalence classes and inputs or vectors of inputs and and uh, identifying boundary cases between such equivalence classes. So let's dive into that material um, uh, if we could. So I'm going to share my screen here uh, and get going. And I will be posting these slides, um, although I will likely have to do it from the airport. Can you folks see my slides OK? Yes, Professor, we can see your okay, slides. OK, thank yep. you. Great. OK, so you recall that in the video, um, I kicked off a lot of this discussion with reminding you of the V level of testing, which makes us reflect on the fact that when it comes to testing a system, um, we can do so at multiple levels of, of, of aggregation of what we're, we're uh, testing and abstraction. Um, often a system will have different layers or, different levels of, of um, concern, such as high-level architecture versus uh, low-level implementation of particular methods or functions. And it's important that we have test cases that can challenge and, and uh, assess functionality and, and correct operation at all these different levels, um, including the at the most abstract level, which is whether a system has reached, has, has satisfied its requirements. The things that, the, the criteria that must be satisfied for the system to be viewed as a success. Um, and uh, I used last lecture to talk a little bit about some trade-offs between automated testing, things we had gone over uh, previously, um, some tips associated with it, and, and to highlight the fact that at any of those levels, uh, with the exception of the very topmost, the, the requirement, um, <clears throat> we have uh, different level, different um, perspectives that we could take in testing. Um, <clears throat> uh, and particularly uh, perspectives as to that distinguish whether we're testing something as a, in a black box fashion or a, uh, a white box fashion. Um, I gave the exception of the acceptance testing because um, typically that's conducted at a, at a behavioral level. Um, but um, these three distinctions um, delineate behavioral testing, um, in, which really deals with the question of how well does the, the design of the system match the requirements. So um, 
given how this part of the system is supposed to behave, um, uh, does it behave properly without looking at its implementation, without looking at the details of how it's implemented, how we actually, how we accomplish that functionally is what it does correct by what we were intended. <clears throat> By contrast, a, a structural or so-called white box or glass box is a better better term for it because it's transparent, lets you see through to the implementation. Here we're asking, to what degree does that implementation um, really match uh, the design? Um, and and we're using we're using information from the implementation to inform our test cases here. Um, so, so the question is a bit different. Uh, uh, we're, we're trying here to often assess, have not just uh, have we built the right system um, uh, according to the requirements, but have we built the system right? That's not quite the right distinction, um, but it but it has some um, some utility. Now um, I probably had noted the, and emphasized that black box tests have some advantages compared to glass box tests. They they can be planned once the requirements are complete, or once for for lower levels of the design, those those design elements are are planned out. Um, the design principles how things are to relate to another. You can plan black box tests. It doesn't require code to be written to see through to the implementation. Black box tests don't. Gla by contrast, uh, glass box tests would. Um, and you can you know, focus on functionality being, being driven by the user and of importance to the user. Now, when it comes to building black box tests, whether it's high in that level of these, um, of high level architecture and the broad system operation with use cases and user stories being captured, or whether it's down there <coughs> at the level of a, of a method or a class in isolation, um, there's, some principles and techniques we can use to form, help us formulate, facilitate the thinking through and, and identification of, of test cases. They can help us at least prevent overlooking certain test cases. Uh, and these techniques um, come in a variety of forms. So we're going to be talk to you about some of them here and some of them in the scope of the course, um, but uh, not all. And you should be aware there's there's others out there, um, some of which are listed here, some of which are beyond the scope of this slide. Uh, but we're going to be focusing today on equivalence partitioning and boundary value testing. And if 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 uh, time allows, we'll, we'll talk about orthogonal arrays. Um, so uh, during our last class of the video, the last video you, la you, you watch, I asked you to try to identify some good test cases. It's cases that, that you could use to test a function con called count substrate and occurrence. And, um, and I've presented here, excuse me, I did it for uh, extracts, uh, extract substring. I'm going to do it now for a count substring occurrence. So this is a, a function. I've, I've written it in sort of Java style. Uh, static types, importantly. So we have static types here. Um, we've talked about that distinction, whether it's variables and, 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 uh, locations that are that are typed or whether it's values that are typed which is associated with dynamic typing here we have like these variables being typed um 
uh, the st string being found, this argument, and, and stir find in that formal perimeter and that formal perimeter. Um, those are typed quantities. They're, they're known to be strings. And, and we have a specification that provides a precondition. You should be able to see it. It's saying that these two are not null and that this uh, string being found uh, is greater than length zero. And what it does is, I should have emphasized that, what it does is it counts the number of occurrences of this string being found within this string to find it. So the first one is, is some string, and it tries to find instances of that string and count them up, tally them up uh, within this other string here, stir find in. Um, so it returns the count of distinct indices i, indices into this, um, at which uh, the substring starting at that index, maybe it's index two, maybe it's index seven, within sure find in that if we were to extract that substring of, of the length of this, it would be equal to that. Um, and uh, so it counts the number of times this occurs in that. So I want I want to use the chat to good effect here. I'd like I would request that people here um, put into the to the chat message uh, some examples of thoughtful test cases. Um, you could just do one, or if you if you if you'd like uh, uh, several um, from a given person uh, that we could use to test this function. So these should be test cases that would help build confidence as to whether or not this function is, is operating properly, given these post conditions and, and preconditions, okay? So, and I'm gonna comment on these um, as they come out, and we're gonna use it as a learning opportunity. So I've got my chat up, and remember, each of them is going to exercise this function. It's going to call it with two strings, two particular strings, and you're going to expect a certain result from that. Um, and you could, for example, test whether the results of this string, um, of this of calling this function with particular arguments gives the expected value. So you could use equals equals the, the expected value. Okay, so I'd like you to start start putting in some test cases. You've watched the video, presumably. So you should have some sense of what those test cases might, might uh, involve in a different function. You could apply that knowledge here. So try putting some into the chat. Okay. So uh, Dan had a great suggestion, test with special characters. That's great, non-English characters. So, so that's, that's a great comment, but what I'm looking for is specific test cases. What was described there was, you know, a broad class, a possible sort of a principle to guide the testing, and that's welcome, but I, I wanna find uh, test cases. Okay, but uh, so a lot of things are coming out. Let's pause for the moment, and I, I want to discuss these because I think they are emblematic of of, of places where we can learn. So um, I see uh, string being found equals null, stir find in equals null, and uh, sort of an arrow giving given zero. Okay, that's 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 um, one way to write it, but it's unnecessarily uh, cryptic. I understand what was being said. For uh, Avi's welcome suggestion, it would be uh, more effective in my mind to write it like this. Count substring occurrence. I'm typing it out right now in the chat and you'll see it in a moment. Null comma null. Um, and what's being claimed is that this equals uh, should equal null. Um, so I'm reframe. I'm simply reframing Abby's suggestion without about without judging it. That this is how I would write that. 
So if you call count some substring occurrence with null in the first argument, null in the second argument, you should get back zero. Is that clear to people? That, okay. So I'm, I'm getting some thumbs up. So now I want to ask you though, is could we do better? Is, is that is that actually a good test case? If not, why not? Anyone? Do, do we actually know it should equal to zero? What, what, why would we judge that it should equal to zero? What 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 in the specification here says that it should equal zero? Is there anything in the specification that that relates to the to in this the case? condition? I'm sorry. Could it, could it be the last part of the post conditions zero if there is no such index? Okay, so so again, a, a great point of opportunity. I I believe that I heard Juan. Is is that right? Yes, that's me. Okay, um, that's great. They said of of Newton. One recognizes the lion by his claw, and I recognized you by your by your voice. So, um, uh, your your comments are welcome. And Juan drew our attention to the post condition, but I want to highlight something. The post condition only applies if what is the case. The post condition is the post condition that's guaranteed if. What? The precondition is met. That is exactly it. It's a conditional thing. It's a contingent thing. The post condition only applies if the precondition is met. You can only expect the function to do its job if its needs to do the job are satisfied. You know, if it's given all the information it needs to do the job, the proper information it needs to do the job. That's if if a precondition says, hey, I need you to guarantee me this. And if that's the case, then I'll guarantee you this post condition. Now, was that, uh, and, and who was it that spoke up there to, to say that? Um, uh, Matthew. Matthew, thank you. I, I thought I also recognized the voice. Um, <clears throat> okay, so... Is the precondition met here? Mm. And no. and and it's not met. Abishiel notes, no, it, it so so it should throw an argument exception or no Yeah, exactly. It should it it doesn't so it's not making any promises technically about the pre you know what it's going to do if the precondition is not met. And there's two schools of thought with this. Um one more rigorous and stringent than the other. Um, many teams prefer the more rigorous one. One school of thought is, look, uh, if the precondition is not met, all bets are off. Um, and uh, you can't you can't properly critique whether it's worth it or not because you should never, call that case. The more rigorous or, or stringent or more um, uh, careful school would say, well, look, if the precondition is not met, there needs to be some indication given as a basic matter of courtesy or um, <laughs> etiquette, if you, if you want, or as a basic matter of offensive programming, you know, going out there and finding errors proactively, you should signal you're 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 leaving an opportunity, you're leaving money on the table um if you don't take action to flag that case. Maybe you could say, not my job, not my not my worry. You didn't meet my precondition, you know, you don't get service. But that's not uh being really a team player in the ecosystem, helping to improve other areas of the system. And if the precondition is not met, it's a good basic service. It's a respectful basic service to make sure that your clients, the folks who called you know that. 
So, so I would ex indeed expect some sort of signal. And in Java, we would expect it to throw an exception of some sort. And it could be an argument exception or a null reference exception, but it, it would be a uh, exception that's thrown. And in Java, you may or may not know, there's uh, checked exceptions and unchecked exceptions. And I didn't actually put it in here, um, partly to make you think what should happen. Um, but we can actually, you know, explicitly say a method throws an exception and um, and there's some benefits that we may get into later in the month. Okay, so so great start to this discussion, but you saw the way I phrased uh, Avi's uh, original suggestion with this count substring occurrence null comma null equals zero, with the null comma null being the, the, the arguments passed in for these formal parameters. Can you give some, okay, here's another one. Here's Eric. Uh, Okay, my people are getting in the spirit. Okay, so let's 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 pause for a moment. Well, I'm okay. I'm seeing lots of good things here. M my heart sings, um, uh, in its feebled way. Um, so, so Eric says, okay, count substring occurrence of empty string, comma a uh, equals zero. Does that match the pre the precondition? Is true being found not equal to null? It sure is. Uh, is it's it's in the empty string. That's not null. The empty string is not null. If you're feeling uncertain about that, please, you know, try try looking up information on the basics of uh, strings in Java and many other programming languages, or come talk with me. Um, an empty string is different from a null string. A null string doesn't point to anything. Empty strings points to a very specific string, one that happens to be empty. Um, uh, is so so the precondition for Eric's suggestion, uh, oops, sorry, um, scrolled up. The precondition for Eric's suggestion uh, is the first clause of it is met. The second clause is also met. It's not null. And it's the string being found um, length greater than zero. Is the thing we're trying to find of length greater than zero that we're trying to find string being found? Yes. What's its length? String being found. One, Please. right? What's that? One, because it's only a. No, the string being found is the first argument. Oh, sorry. Folks, string being found is the first argument. String find in is the second argument. You can see it right there. So is string being found's length greater than zero? No, it's not. No, it's not greater than zero. So this is violating the, the precondition as well. And so we shouldn't be checking whether it's equal to zero. We should be asking, does it throw an exception? Okay, but let's get to some of these other. So so let's ask with Eric's case though, is there a variant of this? Like a small tweak to it? That um, if, we, if we changed it just a little bit, uh, would it be a valid test case? Um, yeah, if you switch string being found on string finding. Exactly. I, I heard Bob say, and, and he's exactly right. Um, if you switch them, uh, it would be fine. And what would we expect the answer to be? If we, if we were to switch the A to, for the first argument and the, the empty string for the second argument, what would the what would the answer be we'd expect? Zero. Zero, indeed. Yeah. Okay, let's go to some of Matthew's here. Count substring of recurrence A in, in BB. Okay. Um, uh, yes, it's uh, that should equal to zero. The, the preconditions are met. Both are non-null. String being found is greater than length zero. It's not empty. Yeah. Um, that's good. Uh, an A in BAB, um, it, it finds it one time. Um, uh, and this third one that Matthew suggested is four. Okay. 
And Matthew's doing something very good here, um, beyond suggesting some um, some working ones, uh, which is excellent. He's also giving reasons for each of them, and he's you could tell that he's choosing his reasons, um, his 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 cases with some care. He's he's saying, okay, look, I want to look for one where there's no occurrence, right? I want to look for one um, where there's um, uh, where there's many occurrences. I think the second one shouldn't be labeled in in Matthew's no occurrence because there is in fact a single. Yeah, that was a typo. Yeah, um, and and then the last one has extra subtlety associated with it, right? Because it's overlapping occurrences. Um, Maybe there's a risk that it's not going to be able to, you know, it eats up the first string, finds the BB in the first part of the stir find in. And because it's eaten it up, it doesn't recognize there's a, a BB that actually is, you know, another BB that's starting partway through that in the second character and continuing on. That's a, a very important um thing to look for because maybe an implementation would eat it up and not realize it you know wouldn't wouldn't keep this ability to to match it in an overlapping fashion it requires a bit of extra care in the implementation and what matthew's doing is anticipating you know that might be something where a silly programming error um uh, would lead to overlooking this important case, um, sort of a greedy strategy where you just use up the first match and you're then look for the second match after that wouldn't give the correct answer. The correct answer per the specification is as Matthew says, it's, it's, um, it's two. Um, so Matthew's exactly correct. There's two places in that, Stir find in where two indices where if you look for the string that begins there of length two, it'll match the string you're looking for. Um, Kurt had a contribution, okay, um, and uh, he didn't uh, indicate the motivation for it, but he's on to something. What is he doing that others haven't done till that point? What is he doing that the previous test cases hadn't captured? Incorporating white space. White space. He wants to make sure it operates correctly under white space. Um, that's right. Or at least it counts it for a single white space. That's right. Um, case one substring is longer than the original string. Yeah, so he's here looking for the sure being found. I wouldn't call it substring, but sure being found is longer than stir find in, and it should indeed indicate zero. You know, you can imagine maybe some silly error where, you know, you're 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 successfully finding all the first few characters of that stir being found, and then you're at the end of the string and you say, yeah, it was found where you shouldn't have. <laughs> okay, Ardalan asks. What about a test case where it could cover most part of the system? Well, um, Kevin, not not sure what system you're talking about. Are you talking about the broader system in which this is embedded, or are you talking about um, the count substring occurrence uh, uh, method? So when you say system, what is the system you're speaking? Um, I'm sorry, I meant me this method specifically. So I wanted I mm. meant uh a test case that doesn't mean like covers all the tests like the yeah. case, but it goes yeah. over all the part of the system mm -hmm. and so we can uh, scan the system and see what happens if all the system gets kind of uh, all the yeah. part of the method gets used yeah so um this this basic idea will feed into some more advanced techniques that we're coming to um that have to do with um coverage testing not not just and for the system as a whole, but even within a, a given method, for example, within a subsection, um, 
you might try to cover the different paths through it. So you might give a string, and we, in fact, we will see strings for those lectures, which are carefully designed, they're quite long often, to exercise multiple paths through the underlying logic. But are those black box cases? They can be. Uh, they can be, but generally to understand what at an algorithm level, at the level of a function, you need to test. Generally speaking, these ones that are, are going to achieve coverage will need to look at the structure of the code within this um, the, the implementation. Uh, black box testing can be done for coverage at the level of broad functionality. For example, your systems as a whole, drawing out the screens that that you have or the you know web pages, whatever it is, and the ways you can get from one to the other. You can reason about you know needing to cover all those different transitions. But if you if you're doing if you're pursuing it at the level of a of a method, of a function, generally you need to do so um, with some knowledge. If you're seeking to kind of exercise the underlying code broadly, uh, it's going to be much more effective if you know something about its structure. Um, you know how it works because you're going to be able to exercise different paths in it, paths that you might just speculate about without knowing, you know, are they using underlying regular expression matcher? Um, uh, you know, are they are they using a, a finite state automaton as, associated with that, et cetera? Um, so we'll come to some methods that involve path testing. Uh, okay, so uh, Juan has a, a very nice longer example with some discontinuous. He, he didn't comment on it. Um, uh, he didn't comment on motivation. And, and I want to emphasize, it's really often a good thing. And in fact, I would strongly encourage you, when you have a test case, often it's motivated by some thinking, like, oh, we haven't looked for this yet. I haven't tried it with non-ASCII characters yet. Or I haven't tried it with, you know, a tab character compared to a space character. <laughs> and it makes you say, let's give this test case a try. Let's put in one for that. Capture that thinking in a comment of sorts after the test case. Maybe it's a literal programming language comment if, if it's test cases in code. Maybe it's a <coughs> comment in one of the testing tables you're, <coughs> you're giving me. Um, we wanna have 100% statement coverage Shouldn't we do it with white box testing? Generally, Quan, that will be needed, and we'll be talking about that um, in a coming lecture. Um, you can make some guesses how they implement exactly to get, try to get more coverage, but these are only guesses without doing glass box testing. Yeah, that's right. Um, any any more examples here? We've had some had some good examples, but there there are some spheres that. Um, I'm not really well tapped yet. Anyone? How about how about some other things? Lowercase and uppercase strings is a is a wonderful idea from Joe. That's a sterling idea. Um, and and what would you do with upper and lowercase? So so that's a great idea. Turn it into a test case, Joe. Or, you know, someone else turned Joe's idea into a test case. That's an inspiration, but we want test cases. So please do not, in your final exams, when I ask for 10 test cases, don't say, you know, some broad thing. Those broad things are great for inspiring test cases, but I want to see specific calls to count substring occurrence that try it with particular arguments and test, does it give the correct response? Maybe it's return value here in int, or maybe it's signal, you know, an exception. So can someone turn Joe's, you know, Joe's idea into 
for example, a, a particular um, case? Okay, Eric is asking, you know, um, does the escape character properly occur in the string? Um, and uh, seems seems reasonable. Um, one thing you you want to be careful about is um, this sometimes comes up with with test cases or other occurrences. Uh, you want to recognize that sometimes the particular environment or language um, in which you're writing the test cases will handle, like it will interpret a backslash in a certain way and it'll strip it out. It's kind of like in probably in 214, maybe you've seen that. If you, you know, sometimes you put together some string or whatever, it has a dollar sign in it or or something like that, and it substitutes into it. Um, and you don't, you don't want it, you don't want it to. Um, uh, you know, uh, you want to make sure in short that the environment which you're writing the test case doesn't strip it out or interpret it before it gets to the testing. But uh, I'll take it, Eric's idea is a, is a good one. Does the algorithm itself, the counts come through an occurrence, correctly handle the backslash character? Make sure it doesn't, you know, um, uh, doesn't sort of ignore its existence in the world. Okay, good, good. Juan um, made good with Joe's uh, idea there. Um, uh, so he confirmed that um, uh, that uh, case sensitive, that it's case sensitive. And he did it in a clever way. Um, he had several instances of AB with different capitalizations in the stir find in. And he knew that, you know, if it mistakes an uppercase systematically for a lower, if it treats the uppercase as a lowercase, treats the uppercase and the thing to be found as a lowercase character, as equivalent to a lowercase character, or if it treats a lowercase character and the string to be found as an uppercase character and the thing is finding it in, um, it, it's going to be some other number than one. So that's a very, that's a very clever test case. One recognizes the lion by his claw. Um, uh, so that's that's good. And and I love Matthew's suggestion with Unicode. It's a big world out there, ladies and gentlemen. It's a big world. And, uh, and we have to be aware that we're no longer in seven bits of ASCII, um, 127, 128 characters. Uh, we're dealing with the Unicode world, and uh, often that we we want to we want to start to test that the system will work with Unicode strings. And this one is is kind of an interesting one because it it gets into um, I, I think what Matthew's doing is he's counting on the environment which this is being put together, like Java to interpret that backslash U, et cetera. But one thing you're gonna to wanna to also do is make sure that this algorithm counts substring occurrence more deeply. I mean, that, that isn't, again, this gets into, are you testing your understanding that the test environment will substitute this for Unicode character? Because uh, in a lot of cases, that substitution gets done before the actual call gets made. So you're not actually testing this code so much as like the harness that or the environment for the harness that's putting it in into place. But one thing you'd want to do, if, if I say Unicode, what would you like to test with Unicode that's not been tested by any of the things, even with Matthews there, the, the germ of a good idea, this you know, nub of a good idea. What thing might we test? Um, uh, that would they'll be really useful with Unicode. Well, what might we want to have test cases for? So 
so Matthew used Unicode coding here in the notation for the string, the string literal, um, to, to encode the character A. But generally, that's an ASCII character, A. Um, happens to be 65 um, or 41 in hex. Um, for in the ASCII alphabet. We really want to test things outside of those 127. We and many of you um, uh, speak as your 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 first language, languages with lots of characters outside the uh, the ASCII 127 uh, original ASCII characters. They may be um, characters that are um, symbolic, uh, you know, that are that are symbols, uh, like in uh, Chinese. Uh, they may be characters written in a different ordering, left to right versus right to left, like in, uh, I believe, in in Arabic, um, or, or some some uh, some scripts. They may be characters that are uh, that that have accents, right? That like uh, uh, in 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 our own country. Um, uh, accent aigu or accent grave um, that that use accents of, of of various sorts on characters. We really want to make sure it recognizes those correctly, um, and you know doesn't just treat um, e with accent aigu uh, to be the same as e without it, or the same as accent grave. Uh, so so we want to we want to ensure that it makes those distinctions um, and, and can act on those distinctions. It doesn't just collapse them all down or doesn't just be hopeless about matching them at all. So I hope this example is giving you some sense. Um, okay, so, so there's a question here. Um, should we also be testing for casting values? And the answer that I would give is a firm no. Um, because what's being cast there, um, uh, or what's being asked there is similar to what I think what's going on with Matthew's uh, question as well, or, or suggestion, the latest, the, the very last one with the um, Unicode. Um, here's the thing. You have your test harness, which is written in some environment or some language. And the goal of it is to test, to call, to you know, set up and call your code. And this code count or the code you're testing, count substring occurrence with um with particular values. And um uh, what's what's being tested there? Should we also test for a casted value? Um, I mean, I, I won't say that you should never test your understanding of that language environment. Uh, I I, th I think you, yeah, you want to make sure your understand casting is correct. Um, for example, uh, but um, uh it and and really what you're testing is your understanding of java and how it calls to string on a value etc um that that yields the correct string i i think what it, like that's not something that's testing count substring occurrence it's kind of testing your understanding that count substring occurrence gives a certain value that will be contained in that. And so I, I don't really think of it as t a test case for count string occurrence. Um, it can be a good test test case for your understanding of, of, of Java and how the Java thing works, but really for test case, um, test count substring occurrence, you might as well take the results of that cast, what it should be, and plug it in there and call it. That will then so maybe the result of that is quote one two three, and you 
you know, plug in quote one, two, three, and the call to count substring occurrence, and it should indeed give, uh, uh, I don't know, it should give two, yes. Um, yeah, and please don't, um, yes, exactly. Th thank you, uh, Matthew. Much, 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 much appreciated. Um, uh, uh, you know, showing an example of these accents uh, to which I was referring. Um, so, um, so another thing that I, you should not include in your test cases that I, I see a lot in student things is like, please, please do not give me test cases that test like whether a stir being found is a string as compared to an int or whether, you know, stir being found is is indeed uh, not a double or that test call this thing with a double to see if it gives, you know, throws an exception or that you're, you're not testing this thing. Java ensures Java, a Java compiler and, and in general static, statically compiled language. It's nothing about Java specifically. It's germane to the whole statically static languages with static typing will tell you when you say, I want to build this code, I want to compile it. Um, it'll say like, you can't pass a double for a string being found. Um, uh, it'll, it'll, it'll warn you that the, it's, that's the, you're testing the compiler's warnings if you're doing that, which is not, not going to be helpful. What you want to do is test this code. Um, and that, this code is living up to its specification as stated here, okay? Um, so shouldn't you be testing a, well, um, no, I, I wouldn't, like single quote A versus double quote A, you're not really testing out. So Tony has a bunch of good ones there that could be tested. Um, but again, it, it, Tony's suggestion would there would need to, yield the test specific test cases. So Tony has the great kernel of an idea, but he needs to turn that into specific test cases. And 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 you know Dan is asking, so we shouldn't be testing single quote A versus double quote A. I mean, really that's about the Java language. Um, it's not about this code. And um, as I say, I mean it's it's not a bad thing to test your understanding of the Java language. Far be it for me to say don't 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 test evaluate but like that's that's not testing your system it's 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 establishing testing of a different thing your your knowledge of of java it's not even testing is java working correctly it's like is my is my understanding of java correct you know that this should be like that you know they should be equal or they shouldn't be so what you really want is you want to have a particular string that you pass in here. Now, that is, you know, for this, like quoted string for stir being found. Now, I'm specifying here unit k, k, uh, tests for this. These are all unit tests, right? You, you can and should enthusiastically and embrace you having integration tests that like, might use count string, substring occurrence with, you know, another extract substring and make sure they play together as you expect they should or what have you. Um, and that they work in compatible ways so that if you, you know, if you call my concat with two strings, A and, you know, string foo and string bar, you know, string one and string two. Um, if you do my concat, if you, if, you, if you do count substring occurrence of string one, comma, my concat of string one, comma, string two, that it should find it within it. I mean, that's not a bad thing that your code plays nicely together. And we're going to, we're going to come and see some of those later to, to see, see examples of that. Um, uh, 
yeah, um, not sure what, what you are suggesting there, but um, like why it's germane to this, but um, it's a fun thing to do. Um, sure. Um, yeah, it's an example of what I was mentioning or that the shell interprets things uh, and, and, and you should be uh, aware of that. The environment often interprets things. So I've been asking for test cases and I've done this because I'm, I'm trying to head off some classic mistakes students make with when putting together test cases where they give me a big set of things. They say, test it with non-English strings. Great idea. Give me the test cases. Give When I say test case, I mean specific call to this thing with specific arguments, testing that it gives specific results. For example, two or zero, or that it throws an exception. Mm -hmm. um, that's what I'm looking for for test cases. Because those are the cases that you folks will have to run for your system. Those are the things that can be incorporated in automated test suites, for example. Make sure that your system is giving proper results. They can be part of your unit test suites that developers can run. This is like prime developer territory. And this is what I expect dear viewers of you as developers to put together unit tests of this flavor to test your code. And through that such testing, you will truly make my heart sing. Okay, so let's let's go on though. Um, because last time we talked about some of the motivation for choosing those test cases. So that's what I meant by giving me test cases. But we we want to have principles, heuristics or hard and fast principles. Um that whisper to us, give us ideas, help us structure what test cases might be most fruitful, most valuable. Testing is in many ways a matter of risk management. For all but the most trivial systems, we, we cannot possibly exhaustively test it. The combinatorics, the, the, there's this explosion of possibilities. And the idea that we're going to test every possible case is, is just flatly ruled out, right? Even that, that example we've been working with, like we can't test it with all possible strings. So we have limited time and, and the time is too limited. So it allows us to test all cases. And what that, what that tells us is that we have to be judicious. We have to pick carefully. It behooves us to be thoughtful in the test cases we choose. And there are a set of these principles that will help us be more thoughtful about these test cases. When, and I, I don't just mean thoughtfulness in some cere purely cerebral fashion. I mean, cost effective. I mean, um, thoughtful by picking out test cases that are more likely to be fruitful, um, that are more likely to to be valuable. What's a valuable test case? What, what's a valuable test case? When I say a fruitful test case, a valuable test case, what would be a valuable test case? What would, what would make a test case valuable? It tests a point at which a system has been known to or is likely to fail. Good, yeah. It's it's designed to, or it, it is such that it is more likely to spot 
errors in your system, often because we have some, um, we have some, you know, known, some experience that certain types of errors are are more likely or or more common or or um, you know, are are more commonly fall through the cracks or what have you. Um, and and we want to we want to put our testing into things that matter, right? Um, um, the things that are likely to yield good good findings in terms of finding problems with our system. Remember, we need to stay away from a mentality where we test to prove that our system works, where we're it's sympathetic testing. We're just, you know, ensuring that um, that we can show, we can prove that that our our system, look, it's it it, it it's giving some correct results. We want to we want to make use of testing that it's more likely to show, um, you know, if there is a if there is a problem, that is more likely to manifest it, and we can use uh, some guidance from past work to understand where likely problems are, where problems are that m might might be more likely than others to to be bothering us. So one of the tools for this is something I talked about in that video, which is equivalence class testing. And it, it kind of goes hand in hand with boundary value testing, as, as we'll see. And, and the idea here is, is a fairly simple one, but it's it's a bit abstract. And I, I want to make sure we can try to concretize it a little bit, make it more, more concrete. Um, the idea is to look. Uh, recognize that when when it comes to testing a, a function here, you know, um, for example, um, not not all test cases are solitudes and sort of totally independent, or totally, you know, unconnected. There, there's kind of certain ones that are grouped, certain ones that. If if you've done one or two of them, you say, well, look, we already really handled that general case, that general principle, um, using the words a bit loosely, that general rule. You know, we've already tested things like that. Well, what is like that? It's it's what we we group these things into these equivalence kinds. If we if if we've got you know, one, two, or three of each of the uh, for a given equivalence class will say, look, it's probably limited benefit, diminishing returns by testing anything more than that, because we probably already ruled out errors like that. So I'm gonna call back up the chat here. Um, are there any equivalence classes that uh, I'm I'm scrolling up here looking at like one's answer, uh or or Eric's answer um, uh, for the backslash, or um, um, you know Kurt's answer, or Matthew's earlier answers, four answers. Are there are there any of those that like highlight some equivalence classes of? And when I say equivalence classes, I mean like sets of of inputs. So in this case, it would be a pair of sure being found, sure find in that kind of once you've tested one such pair, you, there's no need to, to test multiple such pairs. Can you give me a few equivalence classes from those? I'm giving you some pretty broad, broad um, uh, picking grounds. And there's, I'll show you, I'll tell you, there's quite a few equivalence classes that they're hitting on there. One Any? occurrence of a substring? Okay, one occurrence is um, fair enough. Yeah, so you're looking, you're look. I like that. Um, so that that's a fairly abstract one, but it's a good one. Um, so you're looking for cases where uh, the first string here um, occurs exactly once here, and indeed, um, that's a, a broad class. Uh, I'm not sure that 
we want to declare that entire equivalence class something where we only want one or two examples from it because it's actually a such a broad class there might be other criteria within it hmm. right that are that are of interest but you've got a, a good kernel of an idea there um uh because you know we um we can leverage that to to refine that a bit and we'll have some genuine good equivalence classes where picking more than one or two is really diminishing returns can can anyone spell that out a little bit more try to try to maybe it's a subset of those with with one maybe it's those with one and some other characteristic for example anyone I mean, I could expand on my own. Uh, one sure. occurrence of length one? Uh, or is that still too broad? One occurrence of length one is, 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 is good. It's getting more specific. But again, you could have that for like English, you know, like mm. ASCII characters, normal ASCII characters. You could have that for white space, right? You could have it for... Um, uh, for for uh, accented characters and so on. So I would I would say probably you want to restrict it a little bit more to a certain type of character. Um, but it's a good equivalence class there. Yeah, that there's um, like it would be too much to say. Uh, look, I already tested it. Let's go back to Matthew's examples there, right? Where he did count occur count subscript occurrence a in string b a b right and he 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 confirmed that it can find one occurrence we wouldn't want to use that to just say oh we tested all the things with one occurrence so we're not going to test any you know with non ascii characters or you know what non white space or you know with white space characters or 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 yeah um i don't i don't think we'd we'd want to uh do that um uh, e even within that, also, there's going to be things like um, with one occurrence, you might want to test for things which have um, genuinely have one occurrence, uh, but, um, you know, they they might have upper and lower case, which would give the appearance of other occurrences. And I think that was the essence of uh, someone's suggestion with uh I think it was Juan's right later um, with the uh, with the sort of A B variants and stuff like that. He carefully designed it. Yeah, um, the count substring occurrence one with A B A B. So so I I like that. I think you want to be a little bit more um, you know more restrained with it. But it's it's a it's a good good general idea. You certainly and importantly. Matthew, you wanna you wanna make sure you're not just doing that equivalence class, right? You want to make sure, hey, let's look for some which have more than two. Let's look for some which have zero, or sorry, more than have two or more, or some which have zero, mm -hmm. for example. Yeah. Um how about other equivalence classes where, you know, gosh, if if you've got one or two of them, you don't need more. Anyone? One equivalence class be um the length of a string being found is less than the length of a string find in. Mm. Um is less than well uh there's so I I would say the reverse where length of the string being found uh, is greater than the length of string find in. Maybe you want to say, if you've tested one of those, um, uh, where where strub being found is like foobar and strub find in is like foo. Um, if you've tested one of those and it gave the correct answer, which is what? 
What is the correct answer? Looking for stir being found foobar in stir find in foo. What should it zero. get? Zero. Zero. If you've done one of those with foobar foo, you might argue that we don't need more. Um, you might say that's enough for that equivalence class um, because, but but you wouldn't want to. You wouldn't want to say that for those where it's less than it, because that would rule out you, you, um, you know, trying some where there's, you know, foo inside foo bar, foo inside foo foo, foo inside, you know, um, uh, foo foo foo. Uh, <laughs> this is not going to be the most exciting uh, video. Um, uh, so. If I continue, so I think you see, like, you, you don't want to declare that entire equivalence class where stir being found is size less than stir find n as being tested by one thing. By contrast, the one where it's greater than it's kind of hard to imagine an implementation. Well, uh, maybe not. Maybe you want to test two or three. Maybe you want to do it with non white space or with white space characters. Um, or or some sort of funky character like a straight like a star, um, an asterisk or a um, you know backslash or or something like that. But but probably just a few would would do the job if stir being found is greater than stir finding because it's kind of hard to imagine it. You know, having working correctly, saying it's zero for for some of those, but not for others. But um, but you could do that. Um, uh, yeah, you could do it for for those. Uh, I I see lots of equivalence classes here. We're we're coming towards the end of the um, our time together, and I, you know, when I when I look at these, I see, I see like the ideas flowing behind these. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe they were drawn by chance out of, you know, pulled out of a rabbit. You know, rabbit pulled out of a hat or something. I don't think so. Um, like, um, I see in Matthew's comments, like a looking for a inside BBB. Okay, okay. So look, we're we're looking for a case where at least in ASCII characters, um, the, the the string, the first string, stir being found, does not occur in stir find in um at all um uh and maybe you could refine that maybe maybe you don't want to only do one in that um like you might want to allow for cases where there's right like um and this would be um for the same so i'm refining it a bit for the same you know uh for ascii characters less than 127 with uh so by extension no accents and with uh uh all lowercase capitalization or something like that um and uh and then you know if i do that with one i'd say well i kind of kind of did that one like that already one or two like that already so i'm gonna go on and do these others and and he goes on and does you know looking for a single character a inside bab um but then he and, and he kind of convinced himself yeah it seems to work for that at least for these sort of characters and then he goes and looks for a bb inside bbb um and <clears throat> and he's looking for overlapping occurrences and you you kind of confirm that yeah it can spot overlapping occurrences maybe maybe for any type of character and you kind of say well okay we we you know we we've handled that case um we, we don't think it as this sort of mistake where it doesn't allow for counting properly overlapping things um so you can see that like Defining formally what these equivalence classes are actually takes some care. 
But that's not so much the goal here. In, in my view, a lot of the goal is to get you thinking about like what broad categories of strings, what broad groupings of types of cases have we not looked at? What broad things like, again, why not non, you know, why not accented characters, Latin alphabet? Why not, you know, uh, uh, you know, pinyin, or she's not pinyin. Um, so uh, um, uh, with, uh, with uh, Chinese characters, um, uh, Zhongwen, um, uh, characters um uh so the, the chinese uh chinese um uh writing uh symbolic writing uh or why not with um uh trying it with left to right or right to left script or what have you why not try it with white space um these are like you're leaving money on the table if you're not thinking about these broad classes and you should be those are broad classes and you i mean i i'm not going to say you've tested this thoroughly you can't really uh pass the red face test right and say honestly you've tested this really thoroughly if you've only tested it on ascii characters less than 127 you you just haven't done due diligence you, you haven't you haven't really been careful about it so at least you want some of, of each of those. Um, formally defining what, what's an equivalence class, you have to, you know, you, 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 you only need one or a small number for it. Um, can take effort, but it should broaden your thinking about what are these broad classes and make sure you've got at least one from those broad classes so you can genuinely say this thing is pretty you know, it's pretty thoroughly tested or it's tested along, I, I won't say thoroughly, it's been tested along um, common classes or or important classes of, of inputs. Um, when I say classes, I mean equivalence classes uh, more, more generically. So, you know, for user input, you can do this too, right? Um, you can do it for manual tests um, you, you, to design manual tests and, and write them out, of course, um, uh, and you can write it down. You know, if the user is being asked to enter a number, uh, um, and give some, um, and you know, it's a two-digit, um, or it's expected like an age to be a, a, a number between one and ninety-nine. Maybe you try it with zero. Um, Try it with ninety nine. Uh, try it with negative numbers. Um, uh, non numeric characters. It should get you thinking about some, you know, broader, uh, broader classes. Now, the notion of equivalence class is is a little bit um, slippery uh, for reasons we've told. First of all, you know, you often have to to sort of carve out them at a finer level. And you might want to be considering, you know, um, do they lead to the same error conditions? Um, do uh, do they cause similar operations? Maybe these are valid ones. These are invalid ones. Like maybe greater than, you know, zero is not considered a valid number. Um, um, or maybe greater than 99 is not considered valid. Um, uh, or you know maybe it's something which should always be greater than zero, etc. Um, and sometimes you use heuristics like asking are they the right side if the correct value do they do they sort of uh, lead to similar output? These might lead you to sort of group uh, group these things into sort of classes here, and maybe you you diagram it in the decision tree and you want to explore each of the leaves of this tree. Um, you want to make sure that each of these leaves of this tree that for how it handles insurance claim requests for auto insurance based on you know age, et cetera, um, uh, that you've handled each of those cases. So these might be equivalence classes. You know that th for these, no letter of sent. It's it's uh, um, 
it's it's a fifty dollar um, uh, refund or or you know twenty five dollar um, insurance coverage or a hundred dollars and you send a warning letter. You know that each of them has a certain way of handling it, and a bunch of cases are grouped into this based on the number of past claims and uh, and the age of the person. Um, and uh, uh, I see. So this is probably the how much the premium is being raised. I'm sorry. Yeah, how much the premium is being raised as a result of this. So these kind of group cases, and you want to make sure one is handled for each of that. So I'll be looking for your test cases. To what degree are you thinking through, um, you know, the, the uh, these broad classes of possibility? Maybe it's with user, user input to your system. Maybe it's with um, your unit tests. Um, to see if you're identifying some broad cases and make sure you have some examples from that case, but you don't waste your time putting all your eggs in one of those classes when you really have to cover several. I feel that uh, that I uh, um, I'd like to cover more here. Love to to make more comments. But I have to get to the airport before rush hour starts here, and uh, I need to to light out of here. So uh, it's been good to see you. Uh, I regret not being there in person, but I look forward to seeing your presentations on Thursday. And I wish you uh, uh, all the convenience and safety in uh, Snowbound, Saskatoon, uh, and joining you shortly there in our fair city. Thank you and have a good day.